everybody. Hi. Hi. We're back. Hello, hello everybody. I will reintroduce to you hi. Dr. Nice to Ann Shuckett from the CDC. You saw what she had to say uh, on the webinar. We did, as you saw, take some questions from people watching online. I hope you all are prepared with even more questions uh, because now Dr. Shuckett is all yours. Who wants to start? And if not, I, I actually have, I have, have, have more, one right. that I didn't, yeah. didn't get to ask. Yeah, I know you're getting like your full measles day here, right? It's like <laughs> intense. <laughs> Running out of questions. Um, you, or wait, maybe you have one? You, oh, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. One. Hi, go sure. ahead. I'm Hi. Natalie Blocord. I'm a reporter for Politico. Uh -huh. um, and I think it was at the last um, hearing that you testified at, you were talking about what the implications of the proposed cut to CDC's vaccination program would be. And you were talking about how that was going, how you guys were going to deal with that by reducing the purchase of vaccines and trying to increase billing practices for insurers. Right. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how that would actually be done, um, mm -hmm. and like the steps that would actually be taken to try to make people who have insurance have their insurers actually pay for those vaccinations, and and then I guess like what purchasing less vaccine, vaccines means right. for, for real people. Right. The, the last several years we've been working with the um, state and local health departments to improve the capacity to bill insurance companies. You know, local and state health departments are not um, highly resourced, and so they um, used to um, essentially vaccinate all comers and right. children with no insurance were eligible for the Vaccines for Children program but other people weren't. And so they would, if they had vaccine, they would offer it out and they weren't billing the, even Medicaid, let alone private insurers. So we've worked with 35 states now to help them set up systems that often can be self-supporting um, to be able, not to turn people away, but to be able to vaccinate and then bill the insurers for, to get reimbursed. Um, most people in the U.S. don't get vaccinated in health departments, mm -hmm. but we need the resources we get for health departments to do the work that nobody else can do. And um, that's basically, you know, dealing with things like the measles outbreak, the quality assurance of the provider vaccination, um, dealing with shortages, dealing with, you know, all kinds of things. Um, so this has been um, in progress for several years, and the states have been implementing these practices. Um, the cut will mean um, less vaccine for emergencies and outbreaks and vaccinating uninsured adults, um, but we hope that it won't mean <clears throat> less ability to take care of the, um, the vaccination of insured people who generally will be vaccinated in the doctor's office or will, will have insurance that will re reimburse the health departments. Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry about that. Forgot I'm not mic'd. Okay. Right. Yeah. Sorry about that. This is, this is like probably only Politico cares about this, but anyway. Yeah. Uh-huh. Could you talk a little bit about the desirability and practicality of making vaccinations more mandatory across the entire country and also what I think seems to me to be a related product problem of people not really knowing whether they are fully, adults not knowing whether they are fully vaccinated or not, they just don't remember, and there's no there's no central repository uh, that I know of uh, that where you could just go to a website and find out what shots you had, when you, you know, 40 years ago, or, or you, um, and one thing you mentioned in particular the, uh, was the, uh, it was personal, was the, uh, the, the, the assumption that people over, uh, who were born before 1958 uh, Immune, immune, right. had it. Well, I, I, I know because it was, it was remarked on often that I never had, had right. measles. Now, I also know I had the, had the shot, mm -hmm. but I, that's not. So the number is not zero. Right. That's right. Yeah. So let me do the second part first about the um, the immunization information. We are really keen to take advantage of technology so that people do know what their vaccine history is. And um, every state now has an immunization information system or immunization registry. They're not single registry for the whole country. That's not how America works. We have one in every state, and in fact, there's one state that has two. But the, um, the issue is um, for children, 
we really have more and more of their vaccines getting recorded into these registries. Um, I think over 80% of states have what they call lifespan registries that can incorporate vaccine histories for adults, but of course most adults don't have that many of their vaccinations in those registries yet. The, the most of the ones that are in the systems are the you know, people in their 20s who had most of their vaccines recorded when they were children and you know, now they've aged into the adult years. Um, we are working with um, states and with third party vendors and other partners to um, facilitate interoperability between electronic health records and these immunization registries so that there's sort of automatic population of the registries and vice versa. If you cover New York City, if any of you cover New York City, they have an incredible registry where if you're at a clinic there and go into your electronic health record, the vaccines from the registry will fill in the empty cells. You know, you'll find out about all the vaccines the person got somewhere else and you'll get an automatic, what's, what does this person need? Now that we have 17 diseases that are vaccine preventable, no human, parent or clinician can really keep track of everything that is, you know, without um, a system approach. So we're really keen to get the information that's somewhere connected and to use the technology to improve clinical practice and to avoid over-vaccinating and to also, you know, have that record be sustained long-term. There are, you know, some tools that individuals can have to track their, you know, to keep track of their records. At the CDC, we have an automated immunization record until this year, it couldn't link to my, the healthcare that I have to have. So they're starting now to get that exchange between our workplace registry and the, um, and the, the healthcare system. But I think there's, there's promise in the future. It'll probably be better for the younger people. Um, so the first question you asked about the practicality of the mandatory requirements. Well, states have um, had mandatory requirements for decades and they've done pretty well at enforcing them, but what's happened in the past decade or so is that exemptions have become looser and looser. There are some states that have had good experience with tougher exemptions. Um, this may be tough on the individual, not tough on the health system, where you know somebody has to see a doctor, get a form notarized, et cetera, to prove that they really feel strongly about not being vaccinated rather than um, have the burden beyond people in showing that they've been vaccinated. Um, I visited um, one state where I was told many of the people who had exemptions hadn't really not been vaccinated. The kids had been vaccinated, but there were these philosophical views about why should I have to prove that I've been vaccinated in order to go to school. Um, so, uh, you know, they're, they're, things are very different. I mean, a com exactly track that down. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, in Washington State, I don't know if you cover this, but Eastern Washington, Western Washington, night and day, in Eastern Washington, it's this mountaineer kind of view. And it's, you know, we believe in vaccines, but we don't believe in the government or we don't believe in, you know, we want to be left alone. In Western uh, Washington State, there's some communities where people feel like nature's good, vaccines scare me, I'm not really sure what's in them. But the health department and a lot of partners in Washington state have been having an impact and they tightened up their exemptions a couple years ago and they've seen um, a drop in percent of kids that are exempting from vaccines. So I think there is, I think it's, it's more practical than you may think to, um, but again, this is one of those things that the states regulate, the CDC and the feds don't regulate. Could you uh, okay. you mentioned, um, where the states people were saying that some of the exemptions were just a making a statement and not really not vaccinating their kids. Can you say which state that was? Um, that was in Washington state. Well, yeah. Washington. Yeah. I think that may be the case in, I mean, even in a state, it's hard to generalize. There really, I, I guess one theme that I, I feel strongly about is that um, we live in a country of micro communities and our statistics are often national or state level, but the reality is happening neighborhood to neighborhood. So another phenomenon I'm, I'm pleased with is more and more states are making their immunization information uh, accessible to consumers. And so they track school immunizations. Most of the states will track full census of students entering kindergarten, for instance. And a lot of states are starting to post that information. So, you know, parents can figure out, well, at that school, you know, most people are vaccinated. Uh-oh, at that school, a lot of people aren't. So that that's just information for 
um, health, hopefully. So we think um, that uh, disease is spread often at the local level, not at these national or state average levels. Uh -huh. Um, Kimberly Leonard with U.S. News and World Report. I'm just wondering about the logistics of this. Do parents just sign a form saying, yes, my kid was vaccinated? Um, does, I, it might vary, and I'm sorry if, if that's the case, but I mean, is it scouts honor my kid was vaccinated or, hey, my doctor signed this form? No, it's, you, most states you have to have documentation. The, the, okay. the doctor or the health department can, can provide that you know, usually just a printout from the registry, usually, or, or um, and so that's where we say it should be harder to not be vaccinated than to be vaccinated because the parents of the vaccinated are providing proof that their children have been vaccinated. You know, we think that the parents who want to exempt ought to have to do something to show that this is not sort of a whim, that they recognize that, um, you know, that their issues are being addressed. They've had a conversation with a physician, that they, um, Sometimes, you know, it's a concern about costs, that they realize there's some resources to help them with that. If it's a concern about side effects, that they get access to information to answer their questions. Um, and so some states have actually, um, you know, put a doctor encounter into the mix in order to um, right. get, a, uh, to, to submit an exemption form. Okay. But, th so there aren't any states where the parents, I I'm sorry, I'm not a parent, so I'm just not sure, um, where they can just say, no, I know during I th the outbreak in the early 90s, it just disproportionately affected people who didn't have access as much to doctors, and so... Right, yeah, the, the outbreak in the 90s was um, really horrible, you know, and part of that was, I mean, when you look back at it, it's just the kids were in the doctor's office, the parents were there, there was a chance to vaccinate the child, but the child didn't have insurance. And so the doctor's response was, your kid's gonna need to be vaccinated. You can go to the health department to get, you know, you, you'll need to get the vaccine, you know, at the, at the health department. And that was sort of asking a lot of parents, you know, they're there. Um, some of it was that the, the child was there because they were ill and the clinicians were reluctant to give the vaccine in the face of mild illness. And there were studies done to show that actually it's okay to give these vaccines, even if there's a mild illness. A lot of people don't go to the doctor unless something's wrong, but that was an opportunity to protect the child. And so um, things really changed when the Vaccines for Children program came into effect with um, coverage really um, increasing dramatically. And of course, we were able to eliminate measles, but that was um, a program meant to be very simple. You know, the doctor asks a series of questions. The parent says, no, I don't have insurance. Okay, great, I can vaccinate your child. No, Did that come as a result of it? Outbreak? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we lost over 100, it was like 123 people died from measles yeah. in that three year period mm -hmm. in the richest country in the world right. and with a and really a good vaccine. Yeah. And so it was what, what, what people found was that kids were getting vaccinated by age five when they started kindergarten, but they weren't getting vaccinated in the first two years of life against measles. And measles is so contagious that we had a lot of babies and toddlers that had never been vaccinated. It was being spread in inner city emergency rooms where, you know, some kids came in with a broken something or other and others were coming in with measles. And it was really an economic problem. And, you know, right. Congress got us this Vaccines for Children program, which has saved over, you know, it saved over a trillion dollars and it's prevented, we think, about three quarters of a million deaths in the 20 years that it's been in existence. Mm -hmm. Okay, there were other questions. Yeah, back there. Or, yeah, yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, yes, you talked about um, the CDC's and efforts to uh, include uh, vaccination um, information in the electronic health record for uh, patients. Um, would policymakers be interested in having, um, for example, a school nurse as a provider um, being able to access that data, uh, or do you perceive any privacy uh, concerns uh, based on? You know? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there's some states where there's good communication between the school nurses and the, the educational health people and the health department. And there's other states where the federal regulations have been interpreted to not allow that. Mm -hmm. So there's, for education, there's this thing called FERPA, F-E-R-P-A. And for health, there's this thing called HIPAA, H-I-P-A-A. -A. And the federal regulators that I know tell me, you know, these, it should be okay. You know, the school nurse and the health department should be able to 
access information. There's some places where the school nurse has a database with all the immunizations but can't share that with the registry or the school nurse can't look things up in the registry, which is the easiest way, you know, rather than um, having to go get all the records to prove that the person's been vaccinated. But there's other states where the interpretation is, is challenging. And so we've worked, you know, since actually 2009, we've worked with the Department of Education on clarifying the guidance and trying to make it easier. Um, you know, privacy, of, there, there's a lot of privacy that is important in, in the era of uh, computers. You know, we've had to make sure we have good systems. There's a lot of information about children that really needs to be protected because there's so many other things people are trying to do with information about children. But we do think that keeping schools safe and um, keeping kids healthy are very important. So I think there's probably um, fewer real barriers, but there's um, uh, ways that um, the system is working right now that are impediments to sharing information. Right, I guess because the HIPAA, um, the treatment, payment, and healthcare operations are through ways that information can be shared um, under HIPAA and uh, not require authorization from uh, the, patient, the patient or the patient's uh, representative. So that's just some confusion as far as how that's interpreted. Yeah, and it's it's it, it may be more FERPA than HIPAA that the the information that the education system has is supposed to be protected, and the question is is information about vaccines that the education system has shareable with the other part of the state that works on vaccines. Um, you know, mo most states the school nurse can access the registry just like doctors can access the registry, but in some states the nurses can't put the information into the registry. So that's sort of annoying because you don't want the information, you know, if the information is being entered in one database, it ought to be shareable to the others. Sure. Uh-huh. Um, I wanted you to comment a little bit about the situation of measles and the undocumented children. Yeah. And also, um, you know, you did comment on the uh, import of uh, measles to Mexico. And unfortunately, there's a lot of that going on that people are uh, speculating that uh, immigrants in the country are the ones bringing in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the measles. Uh, could you please, you know, expand a little bit on, on both? Yeah, sure. Um, most of the measles um, importations that we've had since 2001 have been um, from American residents traveling abroad and coming back with measles, as opposed to international visitors coming to the U.S. and bringing measles in. You know, there's a lot um, of speculation and, and concern out there about um, infectious diseases and, and immigrants, but the reality since 2001 is that the vast majority of the measles virus that's imported into the country is imported because Americans who are not vaccinated are traveling abroad. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention was um, just to stress that infectious agents like the measles virus don't respect borders, and its vaccines, on the other hand, don't just protect an individual, but they protect the people around the person. And so when that Vaccines for Children program was established, it was established to be very simple for doctors and parents, rather than you know, you have to enroll in Medicaid and get all the forms and, you know, have all your, you know, everything about you figured out. There was a simple series of questions that the clinician asked the parent, and then the clinician was allowed to give a vaccine. And those questions were not, you know, where are you from? Those questions were, do you have insurance, um, basically. And so that allowed the um, um, uh individuals who needed to be vaccinated to be vaccinated on the spot without having to be referred someplace else to get their vaccine or to wait months for doc, you know, for paperwork to be processed. That was really important because we were having this big measles resurgence and it was that convenient, simple, you're here, no insurance, okay, I can give you this, I can give the child this vaccine. Um, so I think that is one of the reasons we were able to eliminate measles here in the Latin America region, uh, PAHO and the countries organized these huge campaigns for measles, um, you know, mass campaigns of the population to really protect um, those who had missed vaccination in the early years. Um, and those strategies, you know, better access here through our system 
better access in Latin America through these rounds of campaigns while they were building up their primary care system but led to the region being able to eliminate the, the transmission of measles. So we can't accurately say that this has been nothing more than rumors and uh, you know, um, misconceptions about what immigrants uh, bring into the country. Right. You know, there, there are a lot of countries around the world that have higher rates of immunization than the U.S. does. So we don't think that our problem of measles right now is related to that. And regarding the undocumented children, have there been any measles um, you know, infections that have been reported to a specific group of the children that have been in the, you know, uh, hosted in these different uh, so I wouldn't be able to give you an emphatic no on that. There, what I would say is that the state and local health departments in 2015 are really busy right now following up the individuals. And, you know, California in particular is really busy following up the, the outbreak in many counties. That, um, but at this point, I don't have information suggesting that's a big problem. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh -huh. work on collecting some of those school vaccination mm -hmm. data um, and found it to be a real mishmash. And even the CDC has, says, has said for years now that this, there's only like 13 states that report the data correctly. How, what are you guys doing to mm -hmm. improve that? Yeah. I mean, some of these states are telling us that they collect the data and then throw it away. Yeah, thank you for covering this because it's incredibly frustrating. But what I can say is we have stressed um, data standards for kindergarten vaccination coverage surveys. Every state does these every year, um, but they have done them a lot of different ways. So the 13 is better than it used to be. Uh, we've issued um, the standards and sort of how to. We've provided technical assistance. We um, really, you know, there were years where we, we didn't actually report the data because it wasn't reliable enough. You know, as you, if you look at our MMWR from last uh, fall, you'll see that, you know, there's one state, I think, that does a 2% sample. And, you know, that's not really going to be the same as these other states that are doing 100% census. Some um, only include public schools. Some include public and private schools. So they're, they're really not all the same yet. But we've been stressing with the states the need to gather this data in a consistent way so that they compare, they're able to compare year to year within the state and that we can start to make sense of the patterns across states. So it's a work in progress. We have been, you know, providing both um, technical assistance and um, uh, priority to that. And I think the media covering this story helps um, generate even more support for its importance. We do think you know, right now there's been this interesting dialogue in the country following the, the Disney outbreak and the, you know, the, the, the voices that are speaking up about measles and vaccination are somewhat different than the voices five or six years ago. We think that consumer access to information is a key part of the equation going forward. Yeah, I would just say that it's an increased, it's of increasing priority to us. So it might not have been as, you know, it was happening, we were pushing it, we're pushing it more now and probably will be linking, um, you know, wanting the resources that we provide states to help them make progress in this. You know, often it's a, a resource issue rather than a policy issue at the state level. There may be some states where there's policies that are like, we don't, you know, we don't want this happening. But I think in most states it's just a question of, you know, stretching the resources as far as they can go. I'm going to um, okay. pause you there. Mm -hmm. Technically, we're out of time, and I want to present you also with our mug from the Evelyn Y. Davis Thank Studios. Thank you so much. Take, take that back to Atlanta okay. with you. And I think it's within the official gift rules. I can okay. assure you. <laughs> just, I have, I have witnesses here. Right. Um, yeah. So let me say we're going to take a 15-minute break, okay. during which you all are welcome to grab a box lunch in the, in the lobby bring it back here and at 11:45, we're going to hear from maggie fox um, who is here and ready and i really appreciate that um, so if you if you have a couple more minutes if you still have questions i think we can sure. do a couple more questions but it, somewhere in this 15 minute window you'll want to
grab your, um, your lunch. Also, if anyone needs to use the restroom, um, it is out that door and there's a code that opens the restroom door and that code is printed on a little piece of paper just before you exit our office on the right. You'll see the piece of paper that has one for the women and one for the men. So that's that. Linda, one yes. more thing. Um, Dr. Walden, of course, is still here. We're very grateful for that. And Dr. Selman from Johns Hopkins is here super early for this <laughs> session. <laughs> so um, when you have a break, you might want to take advantage of these two experts that are sticking around. Yes, thank you both for being here. And, and please help yourselves to a lunch. I yes, have a sir. question. Am I allowed uh -oh. to ask? Please, uh -oh. yes, you are. <laughs> no, I, don't. It's, uh, I was just, and thanks. I, I mentioned after your remarks on the webinar that I was glad I didn't say anything wrong. That I oh, did that. Sure. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you so, a lot of countries have um, require proof of vaccination upon entry. Has there ever been any discussion? regarding that for the U.S.? Because you say that yeah. during the period of elimination, all the cases, obviously, all the outbreaks were due to importations. Yeah, you know, it's, it's actually, that question is starting to come up now. You know, as you know, the, that question for polio has really been a big deal. I don't know if any of you are covering polio eradication, but recently there finally was really the political will and the, the movement of um, the World Health Assembly to go forth with requirement of vaccine, a vaccination against polio for people leaving a country that is still got circulation or at least has circulation within the last six months. So it, right now that's the, the main focus is Pakistan where there's a lot of circulation and it's still exporting to Afghanistan for instance. But it takes years to get that kind of um, global policy um, and really an eradication um, policy. I think there is some discussion right now in, in some of the questions about are, is this from visitors coming here, is this Americans going abroad, um, it's, it's uh, you know, of course we have those kind of requirements for yellow fever in certain countries and, you know, for certain, certain diseases. So it hasn't uh, happened for measles yet, but it's, it's been discussed a little bit. Great. A final question so. before we take a quick break? Okay, cool. so good. We can, you, everybody can get a lunch. Take a little break and we can continue this informally. Thanks. Thank you for being here. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, nice to see you all. You got like a lot of experts here.